<laughs> Hello there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And if you take a look at my wrist, oh, look at that. It looks like it is the first full week of April. And you know what that means? That means that it's the Spring Break Spooktacular. Everybody's been looking forward to this, I know. And if you give me just a second, uh, well, it, uh, it looks like I, uh, <laughs> okay, just, just Billy. Billy, what did you do with my book? Come on, it's gotta be around here somewhere. Well, this... This is certainly uh, kind of embarrassing. I had something planned out for everybody. It was gonna be a great story, and, uh... Mm. Where, uh, where did I put that? Uh, <laughs> okay, just... Just... <laughs> I can't believe it. Shh! God, be quiet, he's gonna hear you. My plans are so nearly completed. I just have one more step left. One very important little step. And it can all be completed with one little book. This book right here, for example. And I need you all to keep a little secret for me. How about I tell you a story? Fair trade, right? Fair trade. How about one of my favorite stories? I've read what you've had to say. A Zalgo story seems to be in order. I call it... He Comes. Forgive the length of this message. This is the first and possibly the last time I have access to a computer, so I thought I'd... I'd record all of this while I can, and... get it to those who should know. I'm leaving. I don't know where I'm going, I, I just... I'm just getting it as far away as I can. Okay, so, some of you know, I took out a loan and opened up my own auto shop a little over a year ago. Business has been going decently well, I can't complain, and I've always been grateful to all of my customers who had come to me exclusively with... God knows, there's so many already established places in town, and... I've been, I've been doing well enough that I was able to hire on my buddy Neil a few months ago, and he's been working hard and helping out really well, as I always knew that he would. Well, I, I needed to take a day and go to Lama's class with Rebecca last month, and so I entrusted the shop to Neil for the morning and most of the afternoon. And that's the day I think everything actually started, because when, when I got back, he seemed to be in a stupor and was was covered in oil. He'd, he'd even had some smeared across his face as if he'd tried to drink it or something. I told him to go home, clean himself up, because we had no clients at the moment. I, I could take care of anyone who came in for the time being. He came back 45 minutes later, but he was still much quieter than usual. He worked as well as he ever did, but something just seemed off about him. I asked him if anything happened while I was out. He just shook his head. I asked how many clients we had. He just muttered something unintangible. I asked him to repeat himself, and he turned and glared at me. And for the briefest of moments, I could have swore his eyes appeared to be completely black. No. No iris, no sclera, just utter, all-consuming blackness. I stumbled back and bumped a shelf, knocking things over, and when I looked back at him, he was still looking at me, but he didn't seem to be glaring hatefully the way that he had before, he just seemed kind of out of it. Just a couple, he answered. Some woman, then a tattooed biker type looking dude. I assumed one of them must have asked for an oil change, and that's when he spilled it. So I asked if he had any trouble, and he simply shrugged. I had looked around the garage while he was gone. I, I saw no traces of an oil spill, so whatever had happened, he must have gotten it all on himself, and none of it anywhere else. Miraculously. He seemed reluctant to talk about it, so I didn't press the issue, and we worked on throughout the day. That day and the next were relatively normal. Other than, him, other than him being awkward and quiet. I asked him if he'd like to go out and get lunch while I tended to the shop. He said, sure. 
When he came back, I was busy doing a diagnostic for a client, so he put the food on the counter in the office to wait for me, and he went ahead and ate. I finished up with the customer. We had to keep her car overnight to figure out just why it kept dying on her, so I asked Neil to give her a ride home. And then I went to grab my food. He brought me some Chinese food and iced tea, so I opened the soy sauce packets to pour some over my own food. When I noticed the strangest thing. It was as if the soy sauce was a... A living thing somehow. Spreading out like dozens of squirming inky black maggots. When it fell into the fried rice and buried itself inside, I took the fork and started to scoop out the rice, look deeper inside, and small smoky tendrils would rise from the rice occasionally and dissipate. I was incredibly hungry at that point, but I was too creeped out to eat that, so I chucked it and, and the iced tea in the garbage. Decided I'd just wait till I got home that evening to eat something. I'd never in my life seen anything remotely like that, and I couldn't even fathom how I would ask Neil if he'd noticed anything similar. As cold and distant as he'd been lately, I was sure he'd look at me like I was a Looney Tune. So I just shut up about it. But that Friday... We went down to the old watering hole as we always do to get some drinks and watch the local bands play, and Neil was just as quiet and distanced as he had been all week. He's not a bad looking fellow though, and so despite him not really going out of his way to speak to anyone, a woman went over to where he was sitting and started talking to him. They, they ended up leaving together that night. Monday morning I tried breaking the ice by asking him how his weekend went. They gave me a nod and muttered alright. I asked him if he got lucky with that young woman I saw him with, and he gave me the smallest grin, which is quite possibly the first grin I'd seen on his face in a week, and said, it went well. I, d I didn't pressure him for details. I know he'd share if he chose to, and his small grin was enough to assuage my worries and lend me some hope that he might get back into his old self soon. The day was relatively busy until about 3 p.m., so I finally had a spare moment to sit in the office and listen to the radio while I waited on the next client. So there I was, leaning back in my chair with my feet propped up on my desk when I swiveled around and looked at my bulletin board that sits behind my head with all manner of clippings stuck to it. I had a few Sunday comic strips such as Garfield, Calvin and Hobbes that I'd read maybe a hundred times since I opened up the shop there. But that day, something was different. The first panel seemed normal, but in each subsequent panel, inky black tendrils crept out from the edges of the frame and from behind the characters. Blood dripped from the ears and eyes and sometimes even their noses and in each of the strips one of the characters would say he comes i sat staring in astonishment for a moment before i realized the tendrils were moving ever so slowly and then each of the characters heads turned ever so slowly towards me i threw myself back away from the bulletin board sliding over my desk and onto the floor i ran into the garage yelling for neil i could not be I could not be the only one seeing this. And to my surprise, he had gone. And so, I hesitantly walked back to the office and peered inside. The comics were still corrupted. But they didn't appear to be moving. I crept over to it and reached out to pluck one of the comics free when I noticed the inky black tendrils starting to seep across the page towards my fingers, moving at least three times as fast as they had before, I jerked my hand away. Nothing good could possibly be coming from letting that block of ink touch me. Of course, I ripped the entire bulletin board down, burned it in a trash can out back, and never spoke of it again. That night, I went home, and my wife was already in bed, fast asleep. My mind was racing. Uh, I, I couldn't even bring myself to eat dinner that night with no one I could vent to. I fell into a restless sleep. 
kept awaking to nightmare after nightmare, seemingly every hour of the night until I just gave up on sleep entirely. But Friday, I went to the bar again. Even though my wife couldn't drink, being pregnant and all, and Neil wasn't really any fun to hang out with anymore, and none of my other friends could seem to be reached. I just needed to get a good buzz, and I'd start feeling better. I downed a couple of beers. I excused myself to the restroom, and I noticed. I was more inebriated than I estimated, so I leaned over the sink and splashed some water onto my face. That's when I heard it. Like a sheet of fabric being dragged across the floor, a voice raspy ever so quietly out of the drain. It sounded like a prolonged exhale for the longest time until I finally recognized words hidden amongst all of those vowels. Ego. Cracks appeared in the porcelain, snaking out from the ring around the drain. At least, they look like cracks at first, but after a few seconds I recognized them as the same tendrils of corruption that I'd seen in the comics earlier that week, snaking their way slowly along. I stumbled backwards out of the bathroom door and right into someone's chest. I turned around and stared up to the pitch black eyes of a six and a half foot tall biker with tattoos covering every piece of exposed skin beside his hands and head. I stumbled quickly away from him and his evil piercing gaze followed me as I retreated through the bar. It felt like a dream where whenever you're running for your life, it feels like running through quicksand. As I walked across the room, I noticed the biker wasn't the only one staring at me. It seemed like every pair of eyes in the place were focused on me, and more than half of those eyes appeared to be perfectly black, with no hint of iris or sclera. A few lips moved, and though I couldn't hear the voices over the sound of the jukebox, I could easily guess what they were saying. He comes. I didn't get a wink of sleep that night. I haven't been getting much sleep for the past couple of weeks, as a matter of fact, which I'm guessing those of you who've spoken to me recently could have guessed. I kept seeing those pitch black eyes staring at me, and I'm, I'm afraid everyone I see will turn and whisper those words to me, staring deep into my soul with that evil gaze. Every time I go near a sink or go to grab a bite to eat, I'm afraid I'll see those inky, snaking tendrils squiggling towards me. Even my wife has seemed cold and distant lately. Then tonight, as I'm driving home from work, struggling to keep my eyes open so that I don't drift into oncoming traffic, my cell phone rings. And it was Rebecca. She was on her way to the hospital to have our baby, and for the first time in two weeks, I was actually happy. She was in the labor room, strapped to the monitor when I got there, watching for her contractions. She barely noticed when I walked in, but didn't seem startled when I sat down beside her and took her hand in mine. I tried talking to her, but she was unresponsive. And I was so tired I didn't even realize I had started to drift off to sleep until the nurse came in, until the nurses came in and started moving her to the delivery room about a half an hour later. I put on my scrubs and a hairnet and went in with her to hold her hand and coach her through like they'd taught us in the Lamaze classes. When she 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 started cursing and screaming. I mean, I, I was prepared for that, as well as her ever-tightening grip on my hand, but when I saw the movement in her tummy, my mind started to reel. The doctor said the baby was crowning and told her to push. I echoed his orders, and she screamed at me with a voice I couldn't begin to describe. When I looked down at her, she was staring up at me with those same eyes that I'd seen on the biker. The same eyes I thought that I'd seen on Neil weeks before. I tried to jerk my hand away, but she maintained her grip. Black tar-like blood splashed to the front of the doctor's scrubs, but he seemed to pay no heed when I looked at her tummy again. Black veins seemed to stand out beneath her skin, pulsating. She continued to stare at me. 
She was no longer screaming, just grinning. Those obsidian eyes boring into me. To invoke the Nesperian hive mind of chaos. She breathed in a raspy voice. He who waits behind the wall. The doctor continued as he stared down at my child. My child. Lying silently. Cradled in his bloodstained hands, he looked up and raised the baby, and it appeared to be covered in oozing, inky black liquid, much like that which had covered Neil a couple of weeks prior. It did not cry out, but it was alive, and it moved when he held it up. When its eyes opened, they were as black as my wife's, as black as the doctor's. In unison, they all breathed his name. Zogo. I ripped my hand free of my wife's iron grip and stumbled out of the room, barreled into the nurse's passing in the corridor just outside. When I stood up and looked back into the room, I could see the inky black tendrils seeming to extend from the doctor and my newborn across the floor to where I stood. I turned and ran down the hall to the elevator, slamming my finger into the buttons. When I turned back, the tendrils had come into the hallway, yet no one else seemed to notice until it slithered over their feet and up their legs, at which point they abruptly stopped, turned, and looked at me with those same obsidian eyes. I abandoned my efforts to call the elevator and broke into a panicked run for the stairs. I ran down the 15 flights of stairs all the way to the lobby, tore my ass out into the parking lot, hopped into my car, and started driving. I didn't know where the fuck I was going. I had just... I just had to get the fuck away from there. I didn't know if I was going crazy. I certainly seemed like it. I just couldn't be around anyone I know anymore. They all have those same eyes and those same dead stairs, even... Even my child. God, my baby. I still saw those eyes staring at me from the cars beside me. And by some strange coincidence, the same biker from the previous Friday night at the bar pulled up beside me an hour away from the hospital and followed me for nearly two miles. He'd turn, stare at me, grinning. I couldn't see his eyes through his sunglasses, but I knew. I knew it was the same guy. His tattoos seemed to move on their own free will. The flaming skull on his right bicep began bleeding from its eye sockets. As soon as I could, I slammed on my brakes allowing him to fly past me. As I swerved to my left and did a U-turn, I, I think I lost him. And that was about an hour ago. I'm in a motel three hours out of town. The first place I found that had Wi-Fi and I'm I'm tired, and I'm shaking, and my hand itches where my wife's nails scratched me open. I honestly don't know what to do or, or who I can turn to, and this, this story will sound insane, and I'll probably be institutionalized, and I'm not sure that wouldn't be the best thing for me, but I just can't bear to look into those eyes anymore. Every time I see someone new, they stare at me and I start to panic because I know, I just, I just know. They're out there looking for me, whatever it is. And I lay down and start to drift off to sleep. There are those words. He comes. He. Come.